messages for us and is a deep think person, a woman of wisdom, I would call her. Her bio says that Mel is a friend of unity, which we certainly know. A wild, creative, and lifelong learner. Mel is an interfaith spiritual director, ordained minister in the spiritualist tradition, and works in restorative justice with focus on how we can do things differently towards love, towards peace, towards healing. Ultimately, Mel's work centers around bigger spaces for belonging and self-acceptance as a bridge. Dear Mel, we're gonna shut down my slides and let your slides take over and come on on screen. We're so thrilled to have you here. Good morning, everyone. Um, as I was putting together the, the talk for this morning, I realized that um, really what I'm linking together is past, past uh, sermons I've shared just with the link of how I got here. And so today is much more about my personal story of the last five years than it is about and, and reflections on learnings that you would have heard me share. Um, over the past five years, but from a personal place of my story and my experience in it. I would say that if these past five years have taught me anything, it is that God, the divine, a higher power of love, whatever we wish to call this powerful presence, wasn't asking us to abandon ourselves. I'm a proud member of the rainbow community. And this is my story and coming back to myself, home to who I really am. I also know this, my story is also a universal story as each of us grows our ability to accept what is about ourselves, about one another, about our world, and to hold the infinite of that, to integrate it. This world calls us and invites us to become dynamic as people. This means that our capacity to hold the all that is, is what we're being called into. You do not have to be good. My religious upbringing came complete with a list of what was okay, not okay, right, and wrong. Didn't take me long to realize that who I naturally was was on the bad or wrong list. In my younger years, I could see how religion was taught to me as a moral authority, less concerned with who I really was and more concerned with me being who it needed me to be. This upbringing hijacked my own ability to discern for myself, impacts that I still feel to this day. The painful truth is that when a belief is at its core at odds with one's authentic truth, it means that that person, if they subscribe to those beliefs, will live their whole life at war with themselves. I know what this feels like, and it nearly tore me apart. I didn't have a choice, not then. I was just a kid. I was told who I was supposed to be. And when I measured who I was in my heart and soul against who I was told I was supposed to be, a deep shame set in because it was then that I knew that I didn't fit. Worse still, if I were to be me, I would be destined to burn in hell for all eternity. And frankly, that idea seemed terrifying. More immediately, I'd be ousted from my church family, my family, and without the support of friends. I could be hurt, teased, bullied, killed. I had high motivation not to be me. I grew up in a small town, mostly Mennonite. There was not one out kid at my school. Who would I have come out to? I remember looking up the word queer in the dictionary. I'd heard it once thrown around and my little fingers trying to point to the word on the page found this as the definition, strange and odd, the description. And it was clear that it, um, when it was spoken that it was meant to say that strange and odd is not a good thing. Now I love the word queer for myself, only used by myself or with others who know that word as celebratory to celebrate those strange and odd things of myself and others. This I would suggest is what makes us who we really are. And there are many ways that the most delightful parts of ourselves take form in these strange and odd places. If you asked me, I would say that our lists of good and bad have been corrupted. 
And the result is that some very lovely aspects of ourselves and those around us are missing. We are being called in and unity absolutely creates open space to call into question what we believe and why, what is good and why, to broaden the, the net of what that is and to examine it. You do not need to be a part of the rainbow community to reflect on the part of you that were oppressed or suppressed through your religion, raising or through the structures of society. The resuscitation of who we really are and cultivating tolerance toward acceptance for what is real and then learning how to be with it is a task that all of us are being called into. In many ways, this is spiritual maturity. And when we resist it, we will resist it because it calls us into the desert of the unknown and invites us to learn and discern for ourselves. And this can be scary. And I assure you, it's also powerfully liberating. You do not have to walk on your hands and knees through a hundred miles in the desert repenting. I learned instead to pretend to mute what didn't fit and I lost myself in the process. To die to the flesh was considered a good thing. Pretending was highly rewarded growing up. Just cut off the parts that don't fit, mute them out, be holy. I felt like Swiss cheese after I removed all the aspects of me that didn't fit. I spent much of my life apologizing for who I was, trying to not take up space. In trauma terms, my upbringing meant that who I was became largely, largely frozen and my autopilot would become please and fawn. Or put another way still, was conditioning that said, I am safe and okay if you are comfortable and happy. I also tried to keep people back from me for fear that they too would become infected with whatever it was that was wrong with me or worse still, that they would find out how horrible I was. The most effective form of oppression is when you can get someone to hate themselves for who they are. There were even times that I could convince myself that this was a good thing, that I could suppress and cut out the bad that was me. In line with much of Richard Rohr's writing and falling upward was the idea of a deep-seated fear of freedom. Freedom for me looked disguised with being alone, rejected, and outcast. Fear was the main motivator in my religious upbringing, though it was named love. I believed love to be a very conditional experience. From there, I put my power outside myself, chasing externally whatever I needed to to be safe and okay. I could be what people wanted. This became my mission and service and part of the reason why I got into ministry. A core belief at least I could be at service to someone. This would become the means for which I would achieve my worthiness. This is how I would know that I was lovable. I was taught to see God in all that religion and society told me was beautiful, and I learned to look away from all that existed, including myself, that religion and society told me was not beautiful. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. And if you saw the back of my car, it is filled with bumper stickers, including one that quotes this line and says, honk, if you are letting the soft animal of your body love what it loves. <laughs> I think St. Francis of Assisi held more a more mature view of Christianity than most of the people I knew growing up. I think most of us are terrified of free, freedom and the trust of self and the responsibility that one requires to live freely, to see that we are choosing and we can change. The words from St. Francis Assisi resonate with me in a new connective way in the journey over the past four years, especially when replacing the word God with love. It is easy to love love in all that is beautiful. The lessons of deeper knowledge, though, instructed me to embrace love in all things. Life is genuinely a mix of everything if we are living fully. So are we. This I have learned is a beautiful thing. In my younger years, I was judged for my inability to sit still between two different services at two different churches. I was told I wasn't listening, and I wasn't. 
I was imagining. I was imagining places of freedom, myself like Alice in Wonderland, different, visiting different lands and people, people like me. I could feel myself searching for them. I couldn't possibly be alone or the only one that was different. That said, there was so much fear to speak up, to question, so I clung to my imagination. Much of my world became exciting and colorful, but internal. I imagined a vision of a place where I belonged with people I could be myself with. This is what kept me going even in the darkest days when I felt most trapped and believed the shame that was being placed on me. I imagined experiencing love that would let me expand into who I really am, love that would want that for me and not fear who appeared. Instead, I was told what to do to get love, what I had to be in order to be worthy of love. Somewhere in there, I miss completely that I am love. I think about my little self and I see so much of me in this tiny little wolf. Little me was wild, captivated with the world and naturally fearless. Little me wanted so badly to learn to howl at the moon and speak to all of nature. So much of me, who I was, just didn't have room or a model to learn from. Nonetheless, the soft fur, the soft body of who I was created a deep internal space to exist. In many ways, I was raised more to be a chameleon. Tell me your despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. This chameleon was taught and rewarded for changing my colors to match the room and the people in the room. But who was I? The depiction of heaven was never captivating for me because I couldn't care less about pearly gates or golden pathways or any other illusions or pretending. I became increasingly angered by disingenuine gestures and how they felt in my body. I was told to be disingenuine. And now I didn't only rage against disingenuine people and places, I raged against myself as well. I was never captivated by a false sense of grandeur, beauty, happiness. I was never captivated by what I was told I should work to, toward. The idea of domestic bliss felt like somebody else's story and being domesticated was and is the last thing I ever wanted. I value realness, my own and others, the expanse of the human experience seen and acknowledged. Without room in the world to be me, it all felt fake until I felt fake and like only a shell of me. As I got older, I believed what I was told. I should marry and have children. I deeply wanted to be a mama, so that part felt in alignment. I also didn't know what lives outside of what I had been taught. I believe Frank Sinatra. Love and marriage, love and marriage, they go together like a horse and carriage. This I tell you, brother, you can't have one without the other. It turns out you most certainly can. That said, when I uh, take a look at my path and where it's led me now, I know I wouldn't change it. My children have been the greatest teachers I've ever had and what it looks like to love unconditionally. Likewise, the people who surround me now have learned to love and see me for who I am. I told my kids growing up, nothing you can do can make me love you more and nothing you can do can make me love you less. I wanted that for them and somehow they are that now in the world and with me. I'm profoundly grateful for who they are and how they love. That said, I didn't feel settled that this was my life and I didn't feel arrived into who I was. The pandemic accelerated this reflective process. I thought, wow, I might die and I'll never get to be who I really am. I was filled with questions and determined to live them fully. Who am I really? If fear were not leading my life, what would I want to do? Why did I give my power away? Why can't I trust myself, my intuition, my feelings? Why do I pretend like I can't lead things that I'm soulfully and fully have the skill set and heartbeat to lead? Why do I have to make myself appear smaller for another? Why am I abandoning myself for another? Why would someone who loves me want me to abandon myself? What is love? 
The most confident and powerful people I've met in my life have been that way because they knew who they were and how to stand in their autonomy and sovereignty and still be connected, gentle, kind, and engaging without losing themselves in it. They seem to understand that they're all of it and so are all of so is everyone else. They knew how to own their own truth and fearlessly and with maturity take responsibility for who they are and their own actions. Most importantly, as a result, they didn't seem to need me to do or be a certain way or fill some role for them because they were okay with themselves. I'm grateful for these people then that they have crossed my path. They have been powerful teachers and a reminder of who I am. I heard recently a quote um, that said, to the degree of self-acceptance is to the degree that we can experience a sense of belonging. I think I understand better after these five years, the words of Maya Angelou when she said, you are only free when you realize you belong no place. You belong every place, no place at all. The price is high. The reward is great. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes over the prairies and the deep trees, the moon, the mountains and the river. Meanwhile, life continues. For me, it was a blend of it all. Meanwhile, bisexuality was the least understood orientation at the time from my perspective, especially as an ultra Christian teen. And as I mentioned, raised in the smallest of towns, it would mean immediately immediate dismissal from my groups, other acquaintances. And at the time I didn't even know any other out people. There was even less space for ideas of open love led and connection led relationships not ones where you make vows once and never have conversations again, but ones that move and change and evolve with you with openness and courage and communication, relationships that upheld choice, freedom, honesty, and authenticity as a value. Even less room was there for gender. Gender back when I was young was given as a job description with roles and responsibilities. And frankly, I was not here for it. Meanwhile, you will experience joy and sorrow, love and pain, loss and gain. Meanwhile, you will touch into moments of hopelessness and somehow stumble towards perseverance, find and lose your purpose and have moments where you literally cannot believe your eyes. Meanwhile, lost and found, uh, become a game we play because to be honest, presence with all that is, is really hard work and relationships of any kind, any description, those are too. Inevitably, every person we meet will indeed be human with a mix of shit and magnificence, and this will include you. Meanwhile, much like the hallways of life where most of life's invitation is to be lived, it is in all the complexities and nuances, right down to the potency of breath. Meanwhile, we can miss this, if we are not coming home to ourselves. These sides that we, we cut off, we make decisions to ignore, are missed by us. I made that decision in my teen years. And when I made that decision, I made the decision to fight for others to have room. But I accepted a belief that there wasn't place for me. I became a fierce rainbow advocate and put my own sexual orientation, way of seeing the world, all the things that didn't fit about me in a grave. I cut them off dead. I would continue to mute aspects of myself out for others desperate to fit. The abandonment of self would lead to years of never quite feeling like I belonged within my community, within my family, within my life, within my body, within myself. I rejected me. And no matter what anyone else tried to do, I knew I held a secret and I believed I would be rejected if I shared it. I can tell you this about the closet. It is dark and disorienting. I told myself what I needed to to survive, to be able to make it through the day, to be safe and okay. The thing with internalized shame for who you are is that it's like creating an inward facing knife and you just slowly cut into yourself a little more each time to remind yourself to stay inside. To hurt yourself, 
hate yourself before anyone else can. For me, after I was done hurting and hurting myself, I just became numb. I spent a lifetime trying to be whatever this elusive normal I heard of was. And frankly, at my saddest inwardly, I would say outwardly, I had nearly appeared to have perfected the script and behaviors of how I was supposed to live life. Why can't I just fit in? Became an inward critique all the time. I built walls to make sure that no one could get near me, to make sure that I couldn't get near myself. I turned off my heart. Outwardly, people would reflect on what a beautiful family I had, how well and put together, wise and well-spoken and strong I was. Inside, the pretending was killing me. I was at the peak of self abandonment The little me and many aspects of me are now parented by adult me who took the risk to step into the realness of who I am. I have learned from that that there is so much space within authenticity, and it is a practice that I am deeply committed to. Meanwhile, the wild geese in the clear blue air are headed home again. The spirituality of my story has come from a place of bringing God and love back into my being and trusting myself. It has also come from the love of those around me who can love me as who I really am. It has come from spaces within myself and from, with, from within others who affirm that who I am was who I was born and created to be, who I was meant to be all along. There is a poem that says, when some hear your story, they'll lean in and others will recoil. And that's how you know. Some have leaned back. But much to my surprise, so much more have leaned forward. I'm also able to receive this love and acceptance because I am no longer hiding, because I accept me. I made the decision to be me in a world that told me there was no room for me. And in that somehow I've made room not only for myself, but also room for others and uh, the people around me in all their uniquenesses, in all their strange and odd in the ways that that takes form to be with what is. Now I would say this, and if I were to have fit in, I would have never been able to tell people the difference between fitting in and belonging. I wouldn't have the passion and fire I have to create bigger spaces for belonging. My heart is perfect as it is. My ability to love is healing. I'm as queer as the day and as long in so many ways, and I'm proud of this a little more each day. I'm left wondering why we ever feared difference. I've only in my journey encountered the pure potency and healing beauty from those I've met who have diverged from scripts of gender, sexual orientation, including how they design and value relationships, how they live and value themselves. From where I stand now, it's tough to imagine a world of either or thinking or binary thinking. It is hard to imagine a world that doesn't celebrate love in the infinite and beautiful valid forms and expressions it takes and that we can grow and change. It is hard to imagine a world where we wouldn't celebrate that we have choices and that we can change. I would challenge humanity to open their minds and hearts instead to operate from love rather than fear to risk picking up the parts of themselves that they thought couldn't exist and to practice tolerance toward acceptance of those aspects of self, to choose realness, to risk vulnerability, to practice authenticity as a value and to grow in capacity toward being uncomfortable and knowing that this is where we grow in the discomfort. Our different lived experiences become a wealth of knowledge for discovery, learning and healing. Our differences become our strength. I can feel it in my soul. There is a new world emerging and I know where I will be standing so that the sun can truly hit my face in all its authenticity as it rises. I will side with love unwaveringly. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. I have learned the description of harsh and exciting together is a quite potent combination. When I began School for Spiritual Direction now over four years ago, 
I wrote these words in response to the question, what does your soul want right now? Peace, the kind of peace that is steady, no matter what the external changes of the world provide. Space, expansion, room to grow and explore, to fall down and get back up, and to be the fullest expression of myself, to do what is actually mine to do. Most importantly, in whatever it is I do, may I be conscious and aware, powerfully and spiritually grounded, at peace and at choice. I would say that I have this and it's growing each day. I would say that it has cost me everything I thought I knew and truly called me deeply into my own values, into my own courage, into my own discernment. Somehow I have found myself and peace within that. Perhaps that is what grace really is. I'm inviting you now into a time of meditation to feel into your own body, to notice, to notice the many infinite aspects of you that are all there present and to simply allow, to simply notice those aspects of self. Breathing into the spaces of tightness and simply noticing feeling the spaciousness of so or the spaces of softness within you and simply allowing those tender parts to hold the spaces that feel challenging you do not have to be good you do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting you only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscape, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the river. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clear blue air are headed home again. Whoever you are, no matter how how lonely the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. as you feel into the infinite aspects of who you are, inviting you to take in and take on the texture of home, of coming home to the all that is in, within you, to, to lovingly parent those parts that you think ought not be there but are, <laughs> to delight in those aspects of you that make you so incredibly and uniquely you, a mix of things that becomes your potency when you hold them, that becomes your capacity when you hold them, that becomes the very thing that connects us to one another. You do not have to be good. Thank you.